Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Lazy Victor, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar, Section 4, Antibiotic Selection, De-Escalation, and Duration. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. This call will be recorded for training purposes. I'll provide you with details on accessing the recording at the end of this webinar. The phone lines will be on mute for the duration of the presentation. We will take questions at the end of the presentation. You can pose a question in the chat box on the bottom left of your screen. Please make sure to send questions to all attendees. At this time, I'd like to introduce Carrie Barton with the Massachusetts Department of Health. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Shira Daron and Dr. Kira Bolak. Shira Daron is a physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Tufts Medical Center. She has been the physician head of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program there since 2005 and is also the Associate Hospital Epidemiologist. On a national level, Dr. Daron serves on the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America Antimicrobial Stewardship Subcommittee and the Infectious Disease Society of America Antibiotic Stewardship and ID Leadership Working Group. Here in Massachusetts, Dr. Jerome has been involved in several statewide initiatives to improve the care of patients with suspected or confirmed infections. Dr. Jerome has numerous publications related to antimicrobial resistance and stewardship. Prasada Kira Bolak is a pharmacist who trained at Massachusetts College of Pharmacy, completing postdoctoral training in infectious diseases at Hartford Hospital. She is the pharmacist head of the antimicrobial stewardship program at Tufts Medical Center, as well as the infectious disease pharmacist for the institution. Dr. Bolak is involved in the Massachusetts Society of Health System Pharmacists, the Council of Boston Teaching Hospitals for Pharmacist Education, and the Society of Infectious Disease Pharmacists. Her research focus is in the methods of optimizing antimicrobial use. I'll turn it over to Shira and Kira. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you all for attending today's uh, webinar. Today we're going to talk about antibiotic selection, de-escalation, and duration. And as always, we're going to start off with a quick polling question. So this is just to kind of get a feel of how, how the attendees today feel about antibiotic stewardship in their facilities. So um, the question is, with respect to antimicrobial stewardship, I feel that my facility A has a program in place, B has a feasible plan to implement the program, or C has little, if any, program or plan. So um, again, um, you know, the, the polls are open, and um, the, the question is whether or not you feel like you have a program in place, have a plan to implement the program, or have no plan and no program. And in just a minute, the results will be up. Um, and we're going to kind of use some of these results to kind of um, guide our discussion today. Um, and those will be up in just a second. All right, so it sounds like the majority of respondents have answered B, that they have a feasible plan in place to implement a program and are in the early stages, which I think, you know, attending these webinars is definitely part of that. Um, it looks like some of our participants have do already have a program in place, and a few of them um, have no program and no plan. So we're going to jump right into um, talking about this concept with a case. So um, let's start with a 68-year-old long-term care resident who develops respiratory symptoms and a chest X-ray is performed that is consistent with pneumonia. So the patient gets started on broad-spectrum antibiotics with tiferacillin tazobactam, which covers some multidrug-resistant organism. A sputum culture is obtained, and two days later, the, that culture grows streptococcus pneumoniae. Um, but since the patient responded so quickly and was doing well, nobody really did anything with the antibiotics, and the patient completed a 10-day course. A month later, that same patient developed urosepsis, so a significant urinary tract infection, with, at this time, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is a pretty resistant organism at baseline, but this specific isolate is resistant to all antibiotics tested, including Tepresol and Tazobactam. So let's think about what could have been done differently. Um, if there was an opportunity to narrow a, the antibiotics the first time around, that could have spared the patient exposure to those broad spectral antibiotics for such a long duration. Um, perhaps there could have been a shorter, more appropriate course of treatment since the 
um, bacteria was relatively susceptible and that the patient responded so quickly, then we had an opportunity to adjust the antibiotics based on the culture results. So with that in mind, by the end of today's talk, um, I'd like for you to be able to identify some appropriate resources for selecting optimal antibiotics to understand the importance of the antibiotic timeout in de determining opportunities for antibiotic discontinuation and de-escalation, recognizing the impact of de-escalation on clinical outcomes and how it actually impacts the, the patient at the end, um, and lastly, for you to be able to appreciate the, um, the appropriate antibiotic treatment durations for specific clinical conditions. So a lot of our um, talk today is going to focus on, on the CDC's Get Smart campaign because it really embodies what we are trying to accomplish here in terms of starting off with the appropriate empiric regimen, not throwing the kitchen sink at every patient every time, or really thinking about what you need to target when you're starting antibiotics, then M being appropriate maintenance of therapy, including targeting, de-escalating, and potentially even discontinuing therapy if, if appropriate. Think about, A, are you treating an infection or colonization? And this is a concept we've visited in a couple of webinars before, but we'll definitely revisit because it's such an important concept. Um, thinking about the right route, um, using IV antibiotics or oral antibiotics whenever possible. And lastly, thinking about the timing and stopping antibiotics as soon as possible because um, less antibiotics is always better. So when we think about starting off smart, we want to choose the most appropriate empiric antibiotic um, for keeping a couple of things in mind. Uh, there's kind of this triad of making sure you want to balance the right antibiotic, targeting the right disease state, and the most likely cause of the pathogen. And all three of these things kind of need to be uh, balanced in order to make sure that you are choosing the best antibiotic. Uh, you want to make sure that um, the antibiotics that you select are appropriate for the, the right disease state you're treating. If you're treating a pneumonia, you want to make sure that the antibiotics do penetrate into the lungs. Um, if you're treating a urinary tract infection, you want to make sure that the, the drug gets into the urine okay. So you want to make sure that you use antibiotics that work for the disease state you're trying to treat. And then when you're thinking about a disease state, we have a general sense of what types of bacteria cause each infection. So we want to target the most likely pathogens for each disease state. As I mentioned, not throwing the kitchen sink at every single patient every single time, but kind of thinking through what is the statistically most likely pathogens to be present and using the narrow spectrum antibiotic that is going to be appropriate for that patient for that condition. And then another part of appropriate – oh, I forgot about that. Uh, yeah, making sure it's not too broad, not too narrow, but just right. Um, and then so thinking about, you know, does this patient need antibiotics right now? Um, because there is a strategy of watchful waiting or potentially assessing, you know, whether the patient even has a bacterial infection. Um, there are a lot of non-bacterial uh, conditions, including viral infections and other, you know, non-infections that can sometimes mask themselves as infections. And if a patient is relatively clinically stable, it is completely appropriate to sit back, watch the patient as they are under your care, and just provide them a little bit closer supervision than you would otherwise, and, and think about, you know, perhaps sparing them the antibiotics in, in the onset and reassessing after a day or two whether they potentially got better with things like uh, you know, hydration or potentially other medications. So some other non-bacterial conditions that often mask themselves as infections it can include uh, COPD exacerbation of fluid overload causing shortness of breath or dyspnea, um, upper respiratory viral tract infections or sinusitis are, uh, can cause rhinorrhea, which may seem like a bacterial infection, but are, the vast majority are caused by um, by viruses and are very rarely effectively treated with antibiotics. And lastly, there are many um, causes of altered mental status. Very commonly dehydration, uh, pain, or other, you know, meds that can cause altered mental status are the cause. And um, a thorough evaluation of 
you know, the cause of a new onset altered mental status re- requires a full workup, which may include assessment of the a urinary tract infection, but can also include vi- various other um, conditions that should be assessed as well. So we really encourage, you know, this watchful waiting strategy to hold off, see if the patient gets better with non-antibiotic interventions, and then um, if after a day or two of the patient's you know, about not getting better, that would be a, a time to reassess and potentially initiate therapy. And then aside from, you know, a- assessing whether or not the patient even needs antibiotics, the other thing about, you know, do we need to bring out the big guns every single time? So we only have a limited arsenal of broad-spectrum antibiotics. And we know that every time we use broad-spectrum antibiotics, that's inevitably going to lead to resistance either in that patient or for the pathogens that that patient may spread around to other patients. So it's going to inevitably cause resistance in the ecology of bugs that circulate through our nursing homes and other facilities. So we only really want to pull these out for patients who are at highest risk for those multi-drug resistant organisms and really reserve them for the patients who um, would most likely benefit from them. So here I have um, listed a couple of um, big risk factors for having a multi-drug resistant organism. I've kind of lumped them into MRSA risk factors and resistant gram-negative, inf- uh, resistant gram-negative risk factors um, because the two um, require different types of therapy and are very unique types of risk factors. So patients who have had um, Almost all of your patients uh, or residents are going to be at risk for MRSA because they're living in a long-term care facility. That's why you're on the call today. But if they've also had a recent hospitalization, recent surgery, if they receive hemodialysis, if they have uh, HIV or IV drug use, and most importantly, if they've recently had antibiotics, those are all risk factors for being colonized with MRSA and potentially having an MRSA infection. Um, Patients um, who are at risk for uh, resistant gram-negative have similar but different um, types of risk factors. So um, not necessarily everyone that's old or has poor functional status is definitely going to have a multi-drug resistant organism or gram-negative, but um, patients who do have resistant gram-negative are more likely to be older and have poor functional status. These patients also often had a, a long hospital stay and especially a long ICU hospital stay. Um, and they have a lot of frequent health care exposure, including, you know, invasive health care exposure like dialysis or other, you know, treatment centers. Um, they may have had recent surgery, may have an indwelling device like a Foley catheter or um, a, a long-term Foley catheter or um, a central line. And, again, most importantly, they would have most likely recently had um, another course of antibiotics because um, antibiotics often select out uh, for resistant infections in the future. So knowing that these are the risk factors, you know, we have to think about what are the antibiotic choices that um, are associated with these multidrug resistant organisms and, and, and making sure we have this broad spectrum coverage. So there's a handful of drugs that have activity against MRSA. You probably have seen um, vancomycin the most commonly um, or some of our oral options like tetracyclines, including doxycycline or minocycline, maybe clindamycin or baxarin. But you may have had some exposure with some of the other antibiotics as well. And again, looking on the gram-negative side, it seems like there's a lot of antibiotics that may cover resistant gram-negative, but we're running out of these antibiotics very quickly. Um, and there's a lot of resistance even within the list that I have listed here. So it's really important that we consider um, really only reserving these for the patients at the highest risk for resistant gram negative. And so I've listed a couple of risk factors on the slide previous, but I really encourage you to use evidence-based guidelines whenever you're assessing each patient for um, what the appropriate empiric antibiotic is and whether or not it should, um, inclu- you know, include broad spectrum and coverage. So uh, the website that we have here is idsociety.org or the Infectious Disease Society of America. And they have a whole host of evidence-based guidelines for all of the common um, bacterial infections. They have so many sets of evidence-based consensus guidelines that 
the, the experts follow these recommendations, and we encourage you to as well. We provide great insight on how to initiate therapy, how to continue therapy, and um, what the escalation and discontinuation look like. They all include durations of therapy and um, markers of improvement as well as markers of uh, clinical failure. So I encourage you to use this website for evaluating um, your patients in terms of their antibiotic appropriateness. So getting back to our mnemonics, Mark, Kira just went over S for starting the right antibiotics. So we're going to move on to M for maintenance, and we're going to talk about another case. Ms. M is a 45-year-old woman with breast cancer who's been in the hospital for one week for complications of chemotherapy. Yesterday, which was hospital day six, she developed low-grade fever, and her urinalysis was positive, so she was started on cefepime. Today, her blood pressure is low, and the lab reports that her urine is growing acinetobacter species. It will be another 24 hours before they have susceptibility testing results. So what do we do with that information? She's on cefepime, and she's growing acinetobacter, and she's pretty sick. Her blood pressure is low. We do not want to be getting this wrong. So one way to approach this conundrum is to look at your hospital or your facility's antibiogram. And so, you know, we're an academic medical center, and you can see here that we've got um, an annual antibiogram on the screen for you to look at. And we generate, our, our microbiology lab generates this for us every year. Um, and you should be able to get something that looks like this from whatever lab does your cultures. Um, they might be able to give it to you every year. If you can get them more frequently, that's even better. If you can get them by floor, that's even better. But this is what ours looks like for the whole hospital for the year 2016. And you can see acinetobacter right at the top, and that's the organism that we're concerned about. We're trying to figure out what antibiotic to use for acinetobacter. So the patient is on cefepime, and cefepime has a 63% um, susceptibility against acinetobacter. So by anybody's um, estimation, that would not be sufficient to cover an infection which we're thinking is relatively serious since the patient isn't doing so well. So we don't want to use that. We want to change that patient to something else. Well, what about the big gun that we call meropenem? Meropenem, broad-spectrum antibiotic, we think of it as covering almost anything. But in this case, 75% of acinetobacter, of which there were um, 18, if you look in the, at the number next to acinetobacter in the parentheses, in 2016, only 75% of those were susceptible to meropenem. Now, generally, experts use a cutoff of about 80% to consider something a good empiric agent for a specific um, organism. And so 75%, again, in a pretty sick patient, would not be considered adequate. And not, without an antibiogram, I don't think anybody, including myself, would have ever guessed that the best antibiotic for that patient is ampicillin sylvascam, which is generally considered, you know, not an antibiotic for, for hospital-acquired or healthcare-associated infections. So, um, so that's uh, something that we've learned from my antibiogram on this day. Um, when it comes to antimicrobial prescribing, just so we're talking about the same thing, there's the word empiric which is talking about the initial administration of a broad-spectrum antibiotic regimen that attempts to improve outcomes while minimizing resistance. And then there's defined or targeted therapy, where you modify your antimicrobial therapy once the cause of infection is identified. You might even discontinue your therapy if the diagnosis of infection becomes unlikely, but the focus should be on de-escalation of antibiotic therapy with the goal to, not to minimize resistance and toxicity, and to improve cost effectiveness. So once you have your data, what's the narrowest spectrum, uh, simplest, least toxic, and least expensive drug I can give this patient that will have equal efficacy? Now, the empiric regimen is often, or maybe even usually, not the regimen that should be continued for the full treatment course. And that's why we get cultures. We get cultures so we can use that data to target therapy using the most narrow spectrum agent possible. But I want to talk about the concept of an antibiotic timeout. And this has become um, a regulatory requirement um, that many facilities are struggling with how to implement. And it's the idea that you reassess your antibiotic uh, prescriptions at 48 to 72 hours. And that, of course, is the time frame at which 
you have clinic, more clinical data and their culture data. So an antibiotic time out can take several forms. You could have a hard stop or a soft stop, meaning you could have pharmacy stop releasing your drug at 48 to 72 hours so that you're forced to um, to reevaluate, or uh, just some process by which you have to um, document your your timeout process or your thought process. You could have an electronic prompt or just some kind of a manual um, documentation or or um, pro form or process by which you uh, assess appropriateness. You could have a, a passive alert if you have, again if you have an electronic system um, where you just click OK or just read something versus an actionable item, for example, an electronic pop-up where you then need to write a or type a, um, a rationale. Um, you, you want to check all your available resources to figure out what your next steps would be in that, at, at that point, and that includes checking your cultures, and that's the most important thing. If you send them, use them to determine your next steps. De-escalation means that you narrow that spectrum to the clinically pathogenic organisms, and that means not just the organisms that you found in culture, but the organisms that you've determined are actually causing infection in that patient. Um, we have talked a lot in the last webinar about colonization versus infection, um, and so you want to be able to uh, critically think about what positive cultures um, are relevant uh, and are, are reflective of pathogens that are truly causing disease versus which ones are present in your culture or specimen but not part of an infectious process. When we de-escalate, we reduce the ecologic consequence of an antimicrobial on the microbiota of the patient. That, in turn, um, has long-term benefits for the patient, um, residents of your facility, uh, that then might be exposed to the resistant organisms that are ultimately are carried by the person that was exposed to antibiotics. And when we choose that next antibiotic, we want to look for hopefully a milder safety and toxicity profile. So here's just an example of one study in which policies shifted practice from high-risk antibiotics as they relate to C. diff uh, to low-risk antibiotic use. And so the upper graph there is showing um, it, the gray uh, curve is reflective of the use of high-risk antibiotics like third-generation cephalosporins. Um, and on the lower graph, that gray bar is reflective of some of the narrower spectrum or low-risk antibiotics, where the black uh, curve is the same in both graphs showing C. diff rates. And so with that shift from high-risk to low-risk antibiotics, C. diff rates decrease over time. Um, and here's a, another study um, about risk factors for C. diff, um, looking at many, many variables in the same study and how they impact um, the odds ratio for C. diff. And you, and you can see along the, the vertical axis there, the one uh, would be um, a relative risk of, 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 um, of neutral. Um, and so that anything on the left side uh, of the bar there is um, protective and anything on the right side is a, is a risk factor for C. diff. And the farther right it is, the higher risk uh, for C. diff. And so you can see that certain things um, uh, are certainly uh, that are well known to be associated with C. diff, like fluoroquinolone use, um, come out significant um, and to the right of the, of the relative risk of one. But what's interesting is that when uh, patients receive multiple drug classes, um, and the more drug classes, uh, the more risk of C. diff. So when patients receive two or three drugs, which is what we often do in the hospital, just so we don't miss the organism, so some combination of a MRSA antibiotic and a gram-negative antibiotic, or sometimes two gram-negative antibiotics, that is going to um, dramatically increase that patient's risk of acquiring C. diff infection. Now, the problem is that if you do en enact policies to shunt or shift your antibiotic use from one class to another, like we found in the, in the study two slides ago, um, what you can end up with is this phenomenon we call squeezing the balloon. And so, you know, in, in, um, in one well-known study, 
sexual foreigns were restricted because of an outbreak of um, extended spectrum bevilacumins or, or sexual foreign resistant Klebsiella pneumonia, and they were successful. They reduced hospitalized sexual foreign use by 80%. Great, right? Except that they increased imipenem use by 141% which is not great. And so you do have to be careful when you are focusing on one class of antibiotics and trying to use less. By definition, something is going to have to be used more. Um, so you certainly want to focus on just using less antibiotic overall to kind of mitigate that problem a little bit. So polling question number two, um, we'd like everybody to um, answer. Um, if you can open the polls, uh, please. Um, I feel that the selection of antibiotics for residents with suspected infection in my facility is generally too broad, A, generally too narrow, B, appropriate, C, or I don't know, D. Okay, we have, we do not, okay, there we go. Okay, so um, vote on the right side. If you don't see your polling question on the right side right now, you want to click on the down arrow right next, to, right to the left of the word polling on the right side of your screen. I think some people, they might be hard to find, and I was actually having trouble finding it. So A, antibiotic prescribing to residents by facility is too broad, B, too narrow, C, appropriate, and D, I don't know. And I think it's important to think about this question um, so that you can um, determine what your initial actions are going to be in the area of antibiotic selection and antibiotic de-escalation and discontinuation. Um, so we'll, we'll see those results in a second. Do people feel that there is a problem in their facility with antimicrobial prescribing? Um, and so it's about actually interestingly split pretty evenly between too broad and appropriate where no one, not surprisingly, no one thinks their antibiotic use is too narrow. Moving on in our mnemonic to the letter A. The letter A stands for are you treating infection or colonization? And as I said, we talked about this a lot in the last webinar, but it's, this is a concept that is so critical that I want to make sure that we remind you and talk about it again, and that is colonization. That means bacteria are present at the site you sampled but are not causing a disease. So an example would be you do a urine culture on a patient that flipped on a banana peel. Um, they didn't actually have um, urinary tract infection symptoms. You find bacteria there. Those bacteria are truly in that patient's bladder but not causing infection. That is in contrast to the concept of contamination. In, in, the, in contamination, bacteria are present in the laboratory sample, but not at the site. So that would be a patient who has a blood culture drawn. Um, they don't actually have bacteremia. Um, maybe they had a blood culture drawn because of fever. The fever turned out to be an upper respiratory tract infection. The culture goes coagulates negative staph. That staph got there um, because uh, the needle went through the skin, the staph was on the skin, and it got into the blood culture bottle, but that patient does not have staph in their blood. Neither colonization nor contamination are indications for antibiotics. And so um, one of the key ways to avoid um, cultures with colonization and contamination are to avoid drawing blood cultures from a central line or taking urine cultures from a catheter. You're going to get results that reflect colonization of those catheters. Um, one little pearl that we like to say is that if you have white blood cells in the urine, that does not mean that you have a UTI, a urinary tract infection. But if you have no white blood cells in the urine, that essentially does mean that you have no UTI, except in some very specific circumstances, like the patient is neutropenic. Candida, I can't emphasize enough, is a frequent colonizer. It can show up in all of the sites that you sample and very infrequently causes true disease. Um, and just to sort of drive that point home, here's a study on the treatment of candidaria or candida grown from urine cultures. And, um, you know, what's interesting here is they looked at uh, fluconazole, which is the typical treatment 
uh, for panda infection versus placebo, and they were able to show that if you looked at catheterized and uncatheterized patients, um, you did see um, more of a, a, a cure rate in the early period when you used fluconazole um, as opposed to placebo. But if you looked two weeks after treatment, um, after the therapy was completed, whether you looked at catheterized or uncatheterized patients, there was no difference in the rate of cure or the rate of candida positive urine cultures because that candida comes right back. Similarly, when we talk about asymptomatic bacteria, and we talked about this a lot last month, um, in selected populations, um, you can see here the prevalence percentages in various types of uh, patients. Um, this is on any given Wednesday. If you were to send a urine culture on this person, how often would that urine culture be positive in the absence of symptoms? And so you can see some of those numbers are quite high. Um, elderly women in long-term care facilities, we're talking 25 to 50 percent. So almost half the time, if you send that culture, it's going to be positive. You know, um, look at the number for um, spinal cord injury, but most importantly, look at the number uh, for patients who have long-term indwelling catheters. 100% of those, after about two or three weeks with a catheter in place, are going to be positive. So what is the point of that culture? If it is to determine whether the patient has an infection or not, you are not going to get that information from that lab study. So moving on in our mnemonic to the letter R for root, um, oral versus IV root. And we tend to use IV antibiotics because we think they're better. But what I want to tell you today is that they're not always better. Um, and there are several antibiotics which actually have such good oral bioavailability that when you give them via the oral route, the effect is equivalent to that of the IV route. And those are the fluoroquinones, linazolid, metronidazole, clindamycin, trimethamine, sulfamethoxazole, or bactrim, and fluconazole. And that is true any time that, that, that resident or patient has normal gut function. In addition, studies show that using the oral route is associated with decreased length of stay, cost of care, and lower risk for Lyme or IV-related infections. Um, other benefits include the fact that you don't have to worry about um, the fluid or sodium that's associated with that, the IV bag. Um, you can utilize enterohepatic cycling, um, which is often a benefit in treating certain infections, and the patients like it more. So think about using the oral route whenever possible, but particularly when using the antibiotics on the left-hand side of this slide. And then um, the last part of our Get Smart mnemonic is that timing. So make, thinking that sometimes less is more. And we've mentioned this multiple times, but we can't harp on it enough that, you know, in the setting of decreasing antibiotic use and specifically high-risk antibiotic use, um, we were able to realize a significant and steady decline in C. diff rates which we know is a big problem for a lot of our patients. There's such a direct correlation between the two. So using less antibiotics sometimes gives you more bang for your buck when, in terms of um, improving patient outcomes. Now, duration of treatment are kind of a nebulous thing. Um, at some point, when somebody decided to start using antibiotics, they made this 7 to 14 day uh, kind of ambiguous course. Um, and we've stuck with that for years. And realistically, only in recent times have we really critically evaluated the importance of actually um, doing shorter courses and whether or not they're adequate compared to the longer courses that we've done historically. And here we see various significant infections that require antibiotic therapy, but when you compare short courses of less than a week or so compared to the traditional long courses, um, there really was no significant difference in clinical outcomes. So you can have a similar rates of clinical improvement for that um, infection, but expose your patient to fewer days of antibiotics 
and then potentially, you know, fewer days of putting them at risk for some of the consequences of antibiotics like adverse drug events and C. diff. Um, here we have a study of almost 100 patients who had a diagnosis of pneumonia, but they had negative bronchoscopic culture, so, you know, really good cultures. And early discontinuation, you know, on day three or four of antibiotics was associated with no difference in clinical improvement compared to the patients who completed an entire impaired course with an average of nine days of antibiotics. However, discontinuation after three days led to a reduction in super infections and specifically super infections with multi-drug resistant in, uh, organisms. So by sparing these patients by only a couple of days, you know, they, they, only, they got maybe five fewer days of antibiotics, but still there was a statistically significantly uh, lower uh, rate of multi-drug resistant infections, you know, later on in those specific patients. So you're not necessarily always just saving the general ecology. It's not always for the greater good. You can even be improving, you know, your direct patient's clinical outcomes, you know, a month down the road. And looking specifically at UTI, um, this study compared seven versus 14 days of antibiotic uh, for treating urinary tract infections. And um, not only did they find no difference in clinical cure, but in the short course or seven-day uh, group, none of the patients developed any oral thrush, but um, five patients of in the uh, longer-term group, the 14-day group, um, actually did develop a thrush, and that was a statistically significant difference. So not only was there no difference in their improvement from their urinary tract infection, but there was also more adverse effects in the 14-day group, so the longer uh, longer term treatment group. So I'm going to ask another polling question, and, um, and this kind of is focusing on your durations of therapy. So there's a couple of indications for which we know you need long term antibiotics, like bacteremia, endocarditis, and osteomyelitis. But aside from those, how often do you feel if you see antibiotic courses that exceed two weeks for your residents? Do you see it, you know, longer than two weeks of antibiotics used frequently, occasionally, rarely, or never? So again, um, please use the, the polling tool on the right hand side of your screen um, to kind of describe how long your, the antibiotic courses are that you generally see. There's, as listed on the slide, very few indications for antibiotic courses to uh, go beyond two weeks, and the vast majority of them should be uh, done in less than one week. Um, but very often we find that due to these arbitrary cutoffs that have been set at some point in history, we've seen people getting a long course of antibiotics. And now when we look at the polling results, we find that um, fortunately, you know, the, the polls kind of suggest the same thing, that most people answered rarely. You know, 41 uh, respondents said that they rarely see um, longer than two weeks of antibiotics, um, with a few people saying never or occasionally and only a handful of people saying frequently. So that's actually really good that we're not seeing those unnecessarily prolonged courses of antibiotics. So I just kind of wanted to circle back to, you know, what, what have we talked about here today? Um, you know, starting off with the most appropriate enteric regimen because, you know, where you begin affects where you end and making sure that you're not using something too broad and not using something too narrow and really selecting that just right therapy. Um, and, you know, you optimizing your therapy by using those evidence-based uh, consensus guidelines that uh, we showed you earlier making sure that you maintain therapy appropriately with um, kind of optimally using your opportunities to target or de-escalate and potentially do early discontinuation of therapy and not necessarily maintaining on broad spectrum antibiotics just because it's working. We always want to think, are you treating colonization or um, an infection? Uh, because colonization or contamination can be a red herring and sometimes distract you from what the actual clinical problem is for the patient. Um, making sure we're always using the optimal route and using oral antibiotics whenever possible because there's a lot of uh, benefits associated with that. And lastly, stopping antibiotics as soon as possible, capitalizing on the opportunity to do short courses because short courses have 
so many uh, benefits to the patient and are often associated with the same clinical outcomes associated with um, improvement of that infection. So lastly, to kind of close, um, you know, we've talked about a lot about a lot of strategies for you to implement, and I want to get a sense of um, how you feel about those strategies. So um, the question is that you feel that the strategies discussed in today's webinar are A, feasible in your facility, B, not feasible in your facility, or C, already being used in, in your facility. So if the moderator could please open the poll. Um, and again, this is really just to assess the feasibility of the things that we've discussed today and whether or not you feel like um, there are any, um, there's opportunities for growth and whether you think that these strategies are feasible, A, uh, not feasible in your facility, B, or already being done, C. Um, because we've talked about so many um, strategies that um, can, some of them are high level, some of them are low level, and really um, require a lot of collaborative efforts between a lot of people to improve antibiotic selection and use uh, in your facility. And um, we all know that improving antibiotic use is going to have a lot of downstream effects like improving patient outcomes, decreasing rates of C. diff, decreasing rates of antibiotic allergies, decreasing rates of antibiotic-related adverse effects, and um, making sure that we're providing the best quality of care to our long-term care residents. And um, we'll use the results from this to kind of assess uh, future topics. So it sounds like the vast majority of people said that a lot of these strategies are feasible in their facility, which is great news. Nobody said that they were not feasible. And many people also said that they're already being done, which is also great news, that we are improving um, care already with the things that we're doing. So with this, um, I'll pause it back to Elise. Elise, are you there? Hi, yes, I am here. Sorry about that. Um, thank you all for a great discussion. So it looks like we have some time for um, some questions. If you have some questions, please press pound six to ask a question over the phone, or you can pose your question in the chat box. Again, that number. Hi, do you have a question? Yes, please. Um, we were just curious about the antibiotics used prophylactically for um, any of the residents that have had uh, histories of long-term urinary issues. I haven't heard a lot of discussion or mention about any of those old culture behaviors of using uh, prophylactic antibiotics. So, I mean, in general, um, prophylaxis hasn't been incredibly useful. There are some people that are on long-term suppression who may be, um, you know, if, if done appropriately under the supervision of, you know, an infectious disease doctor may be appropriate, but the vast majority of people should not be getting long-term prophylaxis for urinary tract infections because the evidence is very poor to support that they actually even work. And then when you think about it, these patients often break through their antibiotic prophylaxis, and when they do, it's with a more resistant organism. So in general, that practice is, is generally not recommended. Other strategies, like using things like methenamine or cranberry, have also not had the best um, efficacy when they've actually been studied. I think it's really important when you characterize a patient as recurrent urinary tract infection, so really ask the question, does this patient have recurrent urinary tract infections or recurrent positive cultures? Um, that's a really key distinction because many times those patients who are characterized as recurrent UTI, um, maybe a couple of them have been true UTIs, but if you look back uh, at the documentation, many of those positive cultures were representative of asymptomatic bacteria, and as we know, some patients can just have chronically positive urine cultures that aren't actually causing them any Thank you. 
Hi, this is Carol Kellogg. A question, will the program be available at another time, for example, for our APRN to listen to or other nurses? Uh, yep. Uh, so um, in the chat box, we have the link um, for you to access these at a later time. Um, and additionally, um, you know, they can be found on um, the website. Um, I think you'll get a link to that um, sent to your email afterwards if you were registered to um, participate today. Thank you. Hello? Hi. Hi, this is Jerry calling, um, Leandro calling DeAndre the name. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, I have a question about policy and procedure. Do you know if um, you're going to have an updated one for the APIC um, manual coming on the stewardship to outline what we need to do at the site? I don't think that it would be incorporated into the APIC manual, um, but these um, there is um, regulatory requirements from the Joint Commission which are being enforced by the CDC. So there are standards, they just won't be coming through APIC probably. How would I be able to access that information? Um, we discussed those at um, length in our first webinar, so if you use the link um, that's sent here and just go to um, webinar number one, um, that has a lot more detailed information about the regulatory aspect around um, antimicrobial stewardship and long-term care. There's a lot of um, links in there as well and resources. And then in terms of finding um, kind of guidelines for how to uh, start and implement a, a stewardship program, uh, one good resource is that IGSociety.org that we mentioned earlier in this talk, uh, where there are national guidelines for how to carry out stewardship. So that, that would be a good place to start. No, thank you. So I'll read off, um, there's a question from Nancy Russo. Um, do you see an increase in GI side effects um, when using oral antibiotics versus IV antibiotics? And um, the answer is, in general, not really, because when antibiotics are given IV, they often penetrate into the GI tract as well. So we tend to see almost the same incidence of um, GI side effects when a drug is given orally versus IV. But patients tend to prefer to just take a pill. It's a little bit more convenient for them to have to get hooked up to an IV. It's it, it associated with a lot of increased patient satisfaction. And um, another question is about, you know, what have, has been done to train primary care physicians on um, antibiotic stewardship. And so that is another independent initiative that's being carried out by the CDC. Um, and um, I will allow... Um, a lazy to kind of pick up on what uh, the QI and QIO is doing. Perfect. Do we have any other questions over the phone? Hi, I'm lazy. This is Janet calling from uh, from Rhode Island. I just hi, wanted to you. offer hi. I just wanted to offer something else for the long term care facilities about their antibiotic stewardship programs. Many long term care facilities do not participate in joint commission. So another resource would be the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. They actually have developed a very, very good toolkit specifically for antibiotic stewardship for long-term care facilities. And it offers some real tools for them to address inappropriate antibiotic use for urinary tract infections, as well as a host of, of other offerings. And that would be something I think they would find very useful. Thank you. Great, thank you. So do we have any other questions over the phone? Okay, perfect. Well, thank you all for that uh, great discussion and the great questions coming through with the chat box and over the phone. Um, I do have a few last announcements before we end today's call. Um, we would like to highlight that New England Clean QIO has a new antibiotic stewardship collaborative focus on outpatient settings which is a great resource for medical directors and other prescribers that treat patients on the outpatient side. The collaborative continues through July of 2019, 
and we encourage anyone interested to spread the word and get involved as soon as possible before our enrollment closes. Please reach out to our team if you are interested in learning more about the Outpatient Antibiotic Stewardship Collaborative. As a reminder, we are also on social media. You can visit us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. New England Queen QIO welcomes your feedback. Please complete an evaluation at the end of this webinar. The link to the evaluation will also be shared via email. Today's presentation is available on our website, and within a few next business days, um, the recording for the and the transcript will be posted. Again, thank you so much for attending.